as well. So I'm excited for this. Excellent. Yes, I'm super excited. Let me see if I can share this screen and see what happens here. All right. Okay. Does that look correct? Oh, we said, actually, I want to make it in presenter view, but I, I don't want you to see presenter view. Can you see presenter view? No, you can see regular view. Presenter view is oh. my thing only. Only I Perfect. Can. Oh, yeah. No, I yeah. want to make sure. Yeah, I forgot that that was you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Perfect. So we'll get started then. All right. Um, hello. Um, I'm uh, Regina Marie Mills. I'm an assistant professor at Texas A&M University. Um, and I'm really excited to talk today um, on my talk on otherhood and mestizo futurism and um, Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales. I was really excited that Jalen Jackson uh, yesterday brought up the game, um, brought up this, you know, this character that's been like a huge deal, right? Um, so um, I want to start with Adali Funama, who writes about Black superheroes, and he writes that Black superheroes have frequently challenged conventional um, and preconceived notions concerning Black racial identity by offering a futuristic and fantastic vision of Blackness that transcended and potentially shattered castified notions of Blackness as a racial category and source of cultural meaning. And so um, Miles Morales as Spider-Man rejects these kind of calcified notions of Blackness, um, like the idea that Blackness is kind of an urban experience of poverty and lack, um, or that Blackness is a monolingual culture. Um, so Miles is an Afro-Puerto Rican superhero. If you haven't watched his movie or read his comics or um, played the video game, um, his mother is white Puerto Rican Rio Morales and his father is a US black American um, named Jefferson Davis, which I always think is super weird. Um, he goes by Jeff Davis. Um, he's originally from Brooklyn, um, though in his video game, he moves back to the, his mother's childhood home in Spanish Harlem. Um, so in Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales by Insomniac, um, players explore the ways in which Miles Morales' superpowers and his Afro-Puerto Rican identity reshape themes um, of Spider-Man to power and responsibility, right? Um, so the game reinterprets this kind of iconic phrase, with great power comes great responsibility, um, to move from kind of the individualist beginnings, right, that Peter Parker should have saved or helped Uncle Ben, right, to a more community-focused one. Um, that is, Miles Morales must grapple with the structures of racism and classism that kind of create his need to be a vigilante in Harlem. So Miles kind of riffs on this responsibility for power um, and what it entails. So we commonly see Spider-Man self-questioning and doubting himself, but also this game asks us to think about, okay, belonging and investment in the community are really important parts of, um, of being, right, of being a superhero. So the Miles Morales video game asks, to whom is Spider-Man responsible and what does responsibility look like, right? Um, and it models this need to respond to the neighborhood that claims him. So um, I wanna talk a little bit too, the first couple of slides are gonna be some of the kind of theoretical foundations that are kind of backing this look. Um, so as I said, Miles reaches new heights for Black Latino representation, all right? He stars in Academy Award-winning film and is the only Afro-Latino protagonist of a AAA video game, um, which, by the end of 2020 had sold 4.1 million copies. Um, by all metrics, he is a smashing transmedia success, right? Um, so that means the status has made him sometimes kind of um, either be, have people be really hostile to him or really celebratory, right? Which means he's often kind of othered as Spider-Man. And when we think about the term other, we often think of it as very negative, right? Like somebody who's on the margins, someone who isn't considered kind of the norm. Um, but I use Isaiah Lavender's idea of otherhood um, to kind of think about um, this combination of what he called personhood, identity, and neighborhood. Um, environment, right, so that the otherhood is kind of this person and neighborhood combination. Um, and it offers a lens for us to consider how characters um, are connected to their individual sense of selves as well as to the larger place, right? So as Lavender contends, this move, otherhood, gives us a way of thinking about how genre plays with race, making of it something other than a simple reflection of historic and current social conditions. Um, while some arguments by readers, fans, and scholars try to dissect kind of how authentically Afro-Latino Miles is, um, in his video game, he does not struggle to exist as Afro-Latino. He's not trying to make an argument to you that he is. He just is, right? Um, so, you know, kind of this, I, I think it's really interesting that he's 
not making that argument about how to navigate being black and Latino. He just is, right? And so this idea of kind of the black Tino really spoke to me as well because um, his exploration of his identity does not happen through over questioning of his blackness or Latinidad, but rather by this effortless incorporation into black and Latino spaces and of course Afro Latino spaces, um, representing what E. Patrick Johnson and Ramon H. Rivera Cervera calls the black Tino, a, dis a designation that recognizes a history of cohabitation between African-American and Latino uh, communities, and that centers cultural and political desires that might yield more solidary futures, right? So instead of wondering about his ethno-racial belonging, he must navigate instead how to enter the fold as Spider-Man, right? It's very focused on like, how can I be Spider-Man? Um, how am I a Spider-Man that's different than Peter Parker? Right. Um, and he also kind of has to navigate that with the loss of his old neighborhood, this new neighborhood, as well as in the first Spider-Man game, he lost his father as well. Um, so there's kind of these losses, but so where is he going to find belonging and investment? Um, the last kind of um, theoretical idea that I'm drawing from, and I think it's because for me, I really want to think about Miles Morales as this kind of transnational and as this Afro-Latino figure. And so using Black studies and Latino studies um, and Latin American studies ideas together to think about how we can interpret and consider him as a character. Um, and that is the idea of mestizo futurism that Juliet Hooker talks about in her fantastic book, Theorizing Race in the Americas. Um, so when we think about Miles Morales um, as Spider-Man, the video game kind of imagines an, an other space, right, where Miles is the norm. So if we kind of think of otherhood alongside Hooker's concept of the mestizo futurism, um, then we kind of can think about this game as maybe a mestizo futurist place. So mestizo futurism, um, according to Hooker, is a hemispheric American speculative tradition represented by W.E.B. Du Bois and Jose Vasconcelos, who wrote mixed what you know she calls mixed race utopias that sought to envision post-racist futures right so in miles morales's video game spanish harlem becomes a mestizo futurist place that dares to imagine a world not dominated or defined by whiteness right and by whiteness you know not necessarily just by white people but by also by this whiteness that's about dominating and white supremacy and superiority right so here in the game, Miles worries more about being accepted by his neighborhood rather than trying to be accepted by whiteness, right? So um, in this case, Insomniac's representation of Spanish Harlem kind of celebrates the neighborhood as a multiracial utopia. And so I'm gonna show some different screenshots throughout to kind of give some ideas and talk a little bit also about how developers talked about this. Um, but for example, we see here um, this Puerto Rican festival that happens near the beginning of the game and you see kind of the celebration. If you're going through Harlem, you see um, a lot of places with kind of Spanish names. Um, you know, Spanish Harlem has this long history of not only being kind of culturally very proud of um, its Puerto Rican and Black roots, um, but also a political history of being proud of those things from the young lords and their occupation of the church um, to, you know, the kind of whole Puerto Rican independence movement that happened. Um, so we can see this Puerto Rican festival that Miles explores near the beginning of the game. Um, but the game also doesn't pretend like Harlem is this perfect place that has no problems, right? It's not without struggles. Um, and so, which is why I'm gonna talk a little bit about how, right, um, he's not totally seen as belonging for a lot of the game until he kind of does this work that gets him claimed, right? Um, so uh, another place that we see this kind of multiracial support system um, and this kind of strong um, sense of, you know, this kind of mestizo futurist place is also in like his house, right? Um, and one of the things we see here, here's a, a screenshot from when you're near the beginning of the game, it's La Noche Buena or Christmas Eve, um, and you're wandering around um, his house, right? Um, you, which was his abuela's house actually, and I'll talk a little bit about that near the end. Um, so we can see also like these paintings that that kind of show, right, also like a kind of multicultural, multiracial Puerto Rican um, identity. Um, and there's also lots of coqui, like the little frogs um, that are little frog like statues and things, Puerto Rican flags everywhere, Puerto Rican art. Um, and so we kind of also have this moment where we're seeing his multiple, um, his multiple uh, identities or multiple connections, right, where he has to choose a record from his father's rec record collection to kind of move the game on. So in that part, we see um, kind of uh, Miles Davis. This is his dad's favorite album that he says, right, he put this on every Sunday while he made coffee. 
Um, and we also see um, uh, Willie Colon and this kind of Christmas, Esta Navidad, right? Um, and how the mom and dad would salsa and move to this, right? And it was Abuela's favorite music. There's also an Otis Redding um, uh, picture. For some reason, I didn't have a screenshot readily available at, of it, but it's Otis Redding, uh, Willie Colon and Miles Davis, right? That like he gets to choose from, but they all kind of are connected to different family members. Miles Davis is dad, Otis Redding is his uncle, who if you've watched the movie, you know, is the prowler and is a, a villain. Um, though in this one, we have a really interesting kind of uh, redemption kind of storyline too. Um, and then Willie Colon, you have the abuela and the salsa and the connection between the mom and the dad, right? Um, so I'm going to go back here since this is where my notes are. Um, so Cologne's kind of salsa represents Abuela's music, right? Um, we have this connection here, all evoke happy memories and kind of show this ease by which Miles and his family live in kind of Black, Black Tino spaces, right? Um, the player then gets to watch a cutscene after you've picked the music out where Miles, his mother Rio, his um, Korean American friend Genki, and his Black Brooklynite friend um, Finn, who is also uh, a kind of semi villain in the game, laugh, joke, and feast, right? Um, and these scenes occupy what Margot Crawford, um, in kind of her analysis of the Black fantastic in popular culture, identifies as a zone, as quote, the zone where Black people find a space to express love, happiness, and fantasy, right? So we have this like really fulfilling community family and friend support community. So just as his father's record collection speaks to the coexistence of U.S. Blackness and Puerto, Rica, and Puerto Rican identity, Miles is easy a mixture of English and Spanish, whether at the very beginning of the game where he's speaking in Spanish with a mover or sometimes he's web swinging across across the town talking to his mother in kind of Spanglish. Um, it's never represented as unusual or something that's kind of like outstanding or strange. Um, so, um, oh, sorry, I forgot that I had one other thing I want to make sure. So I'm going to talk a little bit too about how, um, in the game, so if it's never, it's never really seen in the game, Miles must then find his place after moving from Brooklyn to Spanish Harlem, right? So since we have that grieving the death, Miles and Rio moving to Abuela's old apartment, his mom's running for city council, Peter Parker is going out of town. So Miles is going to be the only Spider-Man in the city. Um, and so the game kind of is also about like, like, okay, so now that Peter Parker's not here, what are you going to do? How are you going to define Spider-Man, right? Um, but Miles' game takes place in a mostly black and brown environment. Most of the characters, whether they're the extras that you kind of interact with or anything else, are black. There's only um, kind of two white characters and none of them that you really get to really see or connect with. So Peter Parker's barely in the game and the villain is a CEO of Roxxon and he, there's nothing made to, to humanize him because, you know, he's a pretty terrible villain guy. Um, and so there's also no white character to which an imagined white gamer, which is what most people assume gamers are, even though there's research to show that in fact, Latinos are, might, might actually buy more game consoles, more games, and identify as gamers more often than white gamers do. Um, and so there's nobody to relate to, if you will. Um, so by existing in a space where blackness and brownness is the norm, there's this other space, right? Um, whiteness isn't entirely separate from the game's concern. Um, as Jorge Santos notes, um, in trying to fill the shoes of his white Spider-Man predecessor, there is kind of this, you know, assumption that we're kind of dealing with kind of whiteness and what is the model we have to aspire to for Spider-Man. Um, but I think it's actually made pretty clear that Miles isn't trying to be a carbon copy of Peter. He wants to be a hero for the context he's in. So in this way, Morales must, um, must show his ability to combine the culture of Harlem and the standards set by Peter Parker, kind of the real Spider-Man, which is often how he's talked about in the beginning of the game. Um, and so that I think is really interesting. So um, one of the ways that that happens is actually by adapting the spider suit that happens. So when Miles receives his first spider suit from Peter Parker, um, it seems to be a kind of earlier prototype. Um, and you can see that it's not the most impressive one. It has little knee pads on it, right? It looks like it's one that you probably could buy at a Halloween shop in a certain way. It's not super impressive and it looks right exactly like uh, a kind of low rent version of Peter Parker's. Um, so, but when he wears that, he's kind of literally stepping into Peter Parker's shoes, right? Um, trying to be a substitute, not his own hero. So in the mid game, Miles designs alongside his friend Genki, his own spider suit as a statement of self-discovery, um, which you can see here. 
the suit's blackness is a kind of surface call to his black Latino identity, right? It is black, literally like him. Um, but it's also what Margot Crawford would call kind of the substance of surface or radical superficiality, right? While seemingly a superficial change, the surface reflects a deeper reflection, exploration of his identity and his values, right? And I kind of just like how Crawford talks about this too. Like, you know, she's not talking about Miles Morales, but, but clothes in general, where she says, it's easy to feel the exhilaration of putting on new clothes that make one move through the world with a new sense of style and self-determination, right? So in a very like concrete way, the player is excited to get new gear, but also knows that this new suit is a claim to self-determination and awareness of what it means to be a Spider-Man in a Spanish Harlem, right? However, his new neighborhood, while not hostile to him as the other Spider-Man isn't willing to claim him as their own yet, right? He must prove himself and be claimed. So Haitian American writer Evan Narcisse, who was a writer consultant um, on the game, um, a narrative consultant, um, said he wanted to represent Miles's journey to become, quote, woven into the fabric of Harlem rather than a hero on the margins. Narcisse adds, to know that you're part of a, the fabric of that society that you're growing up in, that you're not outside on the fringes like we get told so often as marginalized people. They are actually part of the fabric of that city makes you feel connected it, to it in a deep way especially when that connection is a counter narrative to the prevailing societal attitudes about black people specifically, right, end quote. So while the PlayStation 5 video game explores Miles's own discomfort as the other Spider-Man, the game moves him towards feeling more included and protected by the people of Harlem for whom he becomes their friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. And the creative team also developed the game around this theme of adaptation. And so at the narrative level, right, we find this thing of finding belonging in Harlem. But at the level of game mechanics, um, Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales is also an adaptation, quite literally, of the PS4 game from 2018. So we have the same swinging and fighting mechanics, as well as the quick time events, right, where you have to press buttons in a particular rhythm um, in order to continue the game's story, um, which come directly from the Peter Parker Center game. But we also have the kind of remixed or newer adapted mechanics, right? The introduction of Miles' special brand of powers, his bioelectricity or venom power as it's called, and his invisibility. In addition, as a remix kind of superhero, um, Miles responds, how he responds to wrongdoing also reflects his realities um, of Spanish Harlem's history with the police. So if you ever played the 2018 video game, um, one of the ways that you found out about crimes was literally to hack in into the NYPD's major surveillance system. And basically, basically you were surveilling the entire system using these really kind of problematic, right, Oscorp, NYPD um, combination work. But Miles doesn't do that. Um, in fact, what he he has an app that he has people kind of sign up for and he answers to. So they kind of work around the, the police entirely, right? And there's even parts where he feels like he can't go and ask the police for to, to help with investigations. And instead he'll use his, his invisibility to find out clues and try and you can't be seen by the police while you're trying to do it which is different also than the other game <laughs> so I think it's really interesting that this kind of starkly contrasts with Peter Parker's method of tracking crimes and maybe even says something about like how his experience as a racialized teenager in New York would be different and might have make him have a different relationship to the police than um Puerto, but then uh, Peter Parker would um so at the end of the game, and it's kind of the last thing I want to look at, um, Miles' actions in the game's finale allow him to finally be claimed by Spanish Harlem, embracing the mantle of the other Spider-Man. This moment of acceptance um, is represented by an act of mutual protection. So when there's this huge explosion that happens and Miles Morales is like up in the air and he falls down and he's like tattered and torn and his mask is off. Um, and so when that happens, several of the residents of Harlem see him unconscious um, and without his mask. And all these reporters are trying to rush to the scene to see Spider-Man unmasked. But instead, the Spanish Harlem residents that we see here in the bottom picture kind of form this human curtain and keep the media from him. And so when the reporters ask who he is, they refuse to say. And instead they say, that guy, he's our Spider-Man. Right. So this and you can see that's really different from the beginning where the same guy had been like, eh, the originals, he's my guy, you know, like who cares about this, you know, uh, this Miles Morales Spider-Man. Right. Um, so at the end, we have this kind of acceptance that comes because, right, he's mad this he's done this stuff for his community. And so there's this communal acceptance. Right. Um, rather than name him as the rightful Spider-Man or as the Spider-Man, he is our Spider-Man. Right. So it doesn't say the other Spider-Man is not real or this is the real one. This is the one that like is connected to the community. 
right? Um, so that once he sees himself as the neighborhood Spider-Man, he's responsible to this black and brown world that the game has built. Um, and in the post game, his black and red mask is actually added alongside Peter Parker's Spider-Man to the El Barrio mural, mural that's next to his family's apartment. So that mural gets his face added on too, which is why you know that like, he's totally been accepted, right? Um, so um, this is actually part of you know a, a longer article I have forthcoming in the Black Scholar on um, Miles Morales and thinking through kind of black um, Afro-Latina, Afro-Latinx literary studies ways of thinking about him. I'm happy to share the full manuscript with people who want. It's supposed to come out any day now, but I'm certainly happy to share with you the PDF of the accepted manuscript if you're interested. Um, and I do uh, think it's really interesting for us to also think about how um, this, you know, I've been kind of talking about in a very celebratory way, but um, one thing that's really missing from this video game um, is the history of Puerto Rican colonization um, that happens. There's like one brief discussion of his abuela being part of like being very political um, when she was younger and being at a protest back in the day is how they say it, but there's no other discussion kind of of Puerto Rico. And so I think that's one thing we might think about too is how is Afro-Latinidad being marketed in video games and what are the kind of pros and cons and losses of that um even if we see that this game is doing some things that a lot of other video games don't do like thinking about the relationship between superheroes and police so um that's all i'll say for now but obviously i love to talk games and and afro latinx studies so you can email me um and i'm excited for the q a um thanks for thanks for listening i haven't seen anything in the chat but i'll make sure to read it while the next presentation is going on thank you so much that was awesome um i think i can speak for all of us have played the, the original 2018 and the Miles Morales version and seen the movies and engage with Miles Morales in any way. He's a really cool character and it was a really cool discussion um, about this. I'm also excited for the Q&A after. Um, and uh, Dr. Pink said, and I see your question and I will save that for the uh, um, Q&A later. Um, but we're going to move on with our program here. So next up is um, Impossible Translation, Latin American Cultural Representation in the World of the Video Game by Pablo Martin Dominguez, Ruth Garcia Martin, and Begoña Cardinanos Martinez. Uh, muy buenas. Uh, we're uh, sharing, and Lucinda is helping me with uh, gearing up uh, for the presentation. So, okay. Uh, hopefully you can see it uh, uh, well. So why impossible translation? And, and why considering that translation is relevant? Well, basically because um, the first question perhaps is, what is a goth? Uh, what basically the guys from Canary Islands would tell about me, what is a goth, a peninsular guy talking about uh, Latin, American, Latin American video games? I mean, you're not even from here. Well, so first of all, thank you for, for allowing me to, to talk to you all. And thanks for allowing not me, but also my, my colleagues, Ruth and Begonia, to basically discuss why we consider uh, video games uh, dealing with the Latin American background do not really work. Uh, or at least how they could work better or at least uh, provide a better representation. So obviously if uh, the first slide, uh, I mean, I couldn't pass the, the chance to allow uh, absolute uh, advertisement to, to show what uh, Mexico was before the war of, uh, of uh, 1848 and how things could have been different if the, geography, the political geography of the American continent did not shift the way it did. Keep that in mind because uh, by, the end, by the end of the presentation we will talk about alt history and alt history narratives. Okay, so essentially what is the problem we see in, in taking Latin American and Latino themed elements in, in video games? Well, for starters, uh, the act of creating a video game is a demiurgic act. It's basically uh, setting what entities, what beings do exist in the world, how they relate to each other, and what is the hierarchy between them. So in a sense, uh, video games are not different from mythology, at least from creational myths. And that's the reason why Thipakli and the uh, tonsured uh, maze god are there, because those are foundational American some of the foundational American tales about how the world came into being. The problem is that video games do not start from those foundational uh, narratives. They start from foundational narratives that are closer to my area of the world. So in a sense, the world, according to most video game creation, has more to do with Greeks and Romans and perhaps some darker Middle Eastern tale like uh, Gilgamesh, but not 
Hipactli or the or the maze god. So with that in consideration and considering that the problem is translating not just aesthetics, but translating ontology, uh, there are three main venues we can consider for ontology to actually affect how we create and how we mediate video games. The first one is the narrative, the narratives themselves, the stories we tell. Okay, so the problem with aesthetics is sometimes you get it horribly wrong most of the times. And in cases like those, you have uh, the, the vision of the favelas in Max Payne, the third game. Sometimes you get, well, nice and relatively complementary uh, visions of, uh, of Latin America. And you have uh, funny stuff like guacamele or, or Mani Calavera from, from, from Green Fandango, which are fantastic games, yes, but it's just Latin American on a very superficial, very aesthetical level. But sometimes people do it right, or at least better. And that would be the case for Cyberpunk 2077, especially when you have Haitian, a Haitian community for a island of Haiti that does not exist anymore. Yet the Haitians themselves keep existing, but not just the Haitians themselves, but Haiti still exists, even in a disembodied form in the old net, in the form of uh, unchained AIs, which are identified as the Lua. And please, that's taking part of that ontology, in, the, in this case, Haitian, and translating it to video game. So my take is, can we, deep, can we get it further? Yeah, I think so. So sure, we, we really need the full flavor. And as much as I love the scene, the whitest god, Heimdall, played by a black actor, Idris Elba, the problem with the story itself is, geez, Vikings, again, aren't there any other stories? So when we were coming for the, from, from, uh, from Spain to, to give this, uh, this presentation, uh, I, the first thing I thought is, okay, I'm going to Texas. So definitely we need to talk about the par excellence uh, Texas myth, which is the Battle of Alamo. You got it right there. And the closest we have got in video games to representing non-hegemonic white Western characters is games such as uh, Assassin's Creed Origins, where you have Bayek, uh, an Egyptian character. So my guess is, okay, still why using the Western lenses? Why the Heliad and the Odyssey with darker skinned characters? So my thought was, okay, why not going full flavor? And going full flavor mean why not taking an Assassin's Creed into the Haitian Revolution? And a Haitian Revolution not taught by white, uh, by white audiences for white audiences is told by Haitians for Haitians. Why Haiti? Well, basically because I consider it probably the most mistreated or at least one of the most mistreated countries on, on the entire American continent. I mean, these guys were under attack and ostracized since the very beginning, basically, basically because they dared to, to uphold to the very notions of modernity, to the ideas of liberty, um, equality, and, and fraternity. And they were punished for that. They were punished even before Haiti was born as a, as a sovereign nation state. So my take is, okay, why not taking the, that history, that uh, tale of independence, that tale of struggle, that uh, tale of, um, of uh, the quest for freedom and how it got horribly wrong, but through the eyes of Haitians. And that would be the ontological change, not just adapting an already uh, Western um, narrative to non-Western characters, but taking those non-Western characters in their own terms, in their own stories, in their own representation, through their own lenses. Particularly the case of Haiti is interesting, and, spe and especially it's a stark contrast with the way um, Western, uh, Western approaches to, uh, to the supernatural work, because for Haitians, there is no such a thing as supernatural. Supernatural implies above the natural. The Lua and all the elements of voodoo religion is not above us. They are among us which is an entirely different conception. From, from that very notion, I think uh, it's one of the many potential stories that uh, we should be telling instead of um, making more diverse Western stories. The idea would be making more diverse stories, period, not just Western. But there are other venues we think that uh, these elements can be tracked, not just the stories themselves, but the storytelling. Uh, one of the most interesting elements and the most 
interesting developments in the last 10 years is the fact that uh, video games do not have to be linear, do not have to be read from cover to cover as a, as a book. And we have seen that in Japanese video games such as Final Fantasy VII, where you can basically backtrack and replay an intermission which plays and happens at the same time as the main game. Some others, and this game will be taught in, in, in more detail in the next panel, Blasphemous, which is a Spanish creation, a really, really interesting video game, or games that allow you to make your own misadventures and make your own mistakes, such as this Elysium. So yes, we have demonstrated that it's possible to tell tales in, in a nonlinear way, but why do we go to so further places when Latin America is, the Latin American storytellers are the actual masters of nonlinear of nonlinear narratives. And they have been the masters of nonlinear narrative from long before Europeans even knew they existed. And it started with narratives such as the Chilambalam or the Popol Vuh. And today we have uh, authors like Iñárritu. We also have um, uh, writers like Cortázar, like Gabriel García Márquez. And it shows, it really shows in beautiful games such as Mulaka. Mulaka is a game based on, on Tarahumara uh, mythology that essentially takes uh, their ideas of how the world works, what there is, and how beings relate to each other, and turn that into an adventure game with very cartoony uh, graphics, which are otherwise absolutely beautiful. So basically, it integrates a worldview, not just as an aesthetic point of view for a video game, but as a video game mechanic itself. So we were perhaps fantasizing about something that would relate to uh, Disco Elysium, but perhaps set in the city of Juarez, and it would be a film noir that would not play linearly, and perhaps it could resemble at some point the, the books of Chilambalam. So it can go to the future, to the past, back into the present. And it's not just a replaying value, but actually every time you go back and forth, you discover new plot elements. And perhaps this is idealistic, but it has been done in, in, in films. And Latin America has, has shown time and time again that nonlinear narratives are perfectly possible and actually desirable. But perhaps the most conflictive part uh, would be the understanding of Latin America as a whole in the world stage. And that's the big ontological chain game we change we need we need to create. Perhaps we chose um, World War II, perhaps it's the most defining event of the 20th century. And when we discuss World War II, we tend to think about Germany and the borders around Germany. And as a second fiddler, uh, we get Japan and the Pacific War. So the images you have seen, you're seeing here, Iwo Jima, Stalingrad, D-Day, the liberation of France, they typically give us not just hegemonic narratives of Western enlightenment, but hegemonic narratives uh, among nation states themselves. And those hegemonic narratives are the portrayal we're given in video games and the lenses we're given in video games. However, there is an alternative to that and an alternative I'm participating and trying to help a little bit as, as, uh, as limited, as humble as my contribution can be, which is taking a uh, a video game strategy, a video game that portrays World War II, but portrays it from the point of view of alt history, from alternative history. Basically, the idea is that in Kaiserreich, uh, that beautiful game, uh, this mod basically assumes what would have happened if uh, Germany won the First World War and the Russian Revolution never happened. So essentially the game starts in 1936 in a completely different world and an entirely different world. What is interesting is that yes, a second world war is going to be the main event, but it's not the single event that moves the, the, whole, the whole game. Yes, it's crucial, but it's not the only one. And in the case of Latin America, this is far more interesting because um, typically in World War II games, Latin America is basically that place that nobody cares about and where you can extract at most resources to fight the larger war. In Kaiserreich, things change and they change drastically. Why? Because the developers of this mod have done a huge research on the social, political, cultural movements that were going around Latin America. And they created a completely different background, a background where uh, Latin America 
along with other places such as China or even parts of Africa were not the crucial colonial era area of the world where things happen to them. In Kaiserreich, things happen in places. And many of those places can become little centers, effectively giving you um, a completely different, uh, a completely different uh, outcome on, on anthology. Basically, it creates um, uh, a completely um, a completely different in the sense of um, uh, uh, of poly uh, of polymorphic um, uh, anth um, anthology, where there is not just a single cause or a single source for things to exist. In that regard, it's interesting because it follows the theories from, from Walter Mignola from the dark side of modernity, portraying that uh, modernity has been historically uh, a force driven by, by, by European and, and by Western nations, but it doesn't have to be that way. And there are alternatives to modernity and other forms of modernity that can be effectively implemented from understanding the, the world and, and geopolitics in a, in a completely different way. In fact, uh, this idea leads to what Enrique Dussel calls, uh, calls transmodernity, the idea that to transcend modernity, uh, the criticism created by postmodernity is not enough because that's essentially a Western thought criticizing itself. It needs to recover and look at the larger world to reintegrate larger and bigger elements from, from that world. And effectively what Kaiserreich does is that it pays attention to those stories that happened around the time of World War II or perhaps never happened, but could have happened. And in the slide, you can see some of the most interesting cases such as Francisco Villa lived in Mexico like Sandino leading Nicaragua, like the Argentinian civil war between the anarchists of Patagonia and the government forces in, in northern Mexico, like Marmaduke Grove proclaiming the Socialist Republic of, uh, of Chile, like the militias from, from Argentina going around. And there are so many more cases such as Peru and Bolivia becoming a unified nation, Central America becoming a unified nation, or not, or not. So effectively, um, Kaiserreich, creates a completely alternative ontology where modernity is not necessarily tied to a very specific and narrow pattern of what is modernization, nor the center of the world is tied to just Germany, even if, again, it's a crucial element. I mean, the, war, the world war is going to happen again, but it doesn't mean that the rest of the world freezes over and, and starts and stops playing. And perhaps that's the most interesting aspect of video games because they allow realities that could have happened, happen again. And when I, when I was writing and, and, and researching about that, I couldn't help but think that perhaps uh, that is one of the venues where Walter Benjamin was thinking about when he taught about uh, his idea of revolution, which is not the vindication of the future, but the vindication of the past. The resurrection of the past. So for him would be taking the what he calls the tradition of the non-trodden, all those pasts that could have happened but never happened, and eventually making them true. Perhaps not today, perhaps not tomorrow, but someday in the future. And with that, I would like to play a little homage to all those uh, Latin American figures and some of the Latino figures of the 30s and 40s that were forgotten, but are there. And hopefully, I really hope that in the audience, you can recognize some of those faces, like Lucy Parsons, like Sandino, like uh, Minervino de Oliveira, like Zapata, like Fanny Jakowski, because uh, perhaps telling their stories from their own eyes is what lacks in video games and what we actually need in video games. Thank you very much. Awesome, Pablo, thank you so much. That was really cool. Um, I agree that I think video games ha are their own way of telling stories and maybe the best way of telling stories, especially these. Um, and we need these this perspective when we tell these stories. So I'm excited for that Q&A as well. Um, to move on with our program here, so we have some time for questions. Next we have, it's like looking at the world from the other side, far away but real, analyzing Dragon Age origins and Dragon Age 2 through the prism of queer temporal temporality that's hard to say, temporality, sorry, by Maria de Sá Frizeira from North Carolina State University. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, let me share the screen here real quick. So 
Come on, this is my toy computer. So, um, hello, uh, thank you for the opportunity and for my friends and family to be here, colleagues here seeing me today. Yeah, it's not a very easy word to say. I am in the first year of the Communication, Rhetoric, and Digital Media program at MCSU. Uh, is it recording? Oh yeah, it is, it's not. Um, I am a game design specialist. I co-owned a queer game studio called Trinka in between 2016 and 2017. I'm also a master's in poetics of technology from the Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais in Brazil. And my main research interest is media and attachment, particularly video games and attachment. I'm also a terrible Pokemon trainer and I've been really into Pokemon Legends or series. As you can see, I'm really bad. So let's start with uh, Dragon Age. Um, Dragon Age is a video game franchise uh, launched by BioWare from the RPG genre or action RPG genre, depending on how you see, uh, launched by the, the company BioWare in, 20, in, in 2009 after a cycle of development that took seven years. Um, BioWare had already reached a lot of success by doing several uh, very successful games for other IPs, such as Knights of the Old Republic, but in Baldur's Gate, but they had started to do also work with the space opera Mass Effect the year before, launched the year before, which is more of an action RPG than of a classic RPG. And then they launched this high dark fantasy RPG that is Dragon Age. Um, so they started with the title called Dragon Age Origins, which was launched, this one that started in 2002 and was launched in 2009, more or less. No, it started more or less in 2002. And uh, it was a very complex um, RPG that reached a lot of praise. It is one of the most praised RPG experiences in Metacritics. And it's being universally, universally praised by its good characterization, compelling story, and the, the inspiration in Tolkien-esque and like J.R.R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire before it was a phenomenon. It had inspired, the books had inspired the games. It's, uh, and it's because it is a traditional high fantasy hero story that is subverted by the constraints of a very dark world and an inescapable fate. And of course, great characters, morally great um, setting, et cetera. One of the things that made a lot of difference in Dragon Age Origins is that you had six origin stories that you could choose. And it wasn't not just a plain background. You had one hour, one, one hour and a half um, of playable, um, play up of a playable uh, prologue that had a depth that really brought you to um, to know what was going on with each character. You had recurring character from the prologue inside the main story, so you really felt like connected to this world and to your characters. So it was like considered a universal success. You had all kinds of praise. Oh, it got wrong. It got the best like rates possible. And even today, it is considered BioWare's biggest success, their magnum opus as is. And then um, around the time that Dragon Age Origins was released, and they were still basking in this victory that was like a long development cycle resulting in a highly successful games. Um, EA bought um, BioWare and they gave the team 14 to 16 months of development for Dragon Age 2, which 
uh, if you've ever been in game development, is absolutely no time at all. And so you you ended up with a rushed product that was like burned by the audiences. Uh, while most of the the sorry. Most of the media was saying that it was a good game, regardless, just not as good at Dragon Age Origins. It had a terrible public reception, and um, you had a lot of think pieces saying, oh, what could go wrong, and how is this jointed, and it had a terrible user score. It is considered the worst of the main trilogy. And uh, it really caused the designer said that it, it, it was a, a nightmare to develop a nightmare to release and a nightmare afterwards. However, they say it was one of the things they are most proud of, one of the products they're most proud of is Dragon Age 2, which is very interesting. Today, it kind of became a cult classic. You had this idea of a lot of think pieces going, oh, it was an amazing game, such a shame that it did not have time to become this great game. But um, why do they say that it could have been a great game, but it's not? Well, when you compare the, how people, how the, the media frames it, you have that Dragon Age Origins is like the high standard and Dragon Age 2 was something that could have been great and isn't. But this is because you have those media and players are judging it through a triple A perspective. A uh, triple A game is not a concise formal definition. It is a definition that came to be in the late 90s, the early 2000s. And the nomenclature is from the financial market jargon that is the most reliable bond that you have. So they're not going to break, you're not going to lose it. That's why they're more expensive. And so that's what it is. They are to the gaming industry, what a blockbuster is to the movie industry. They do not have a formal definition because a lot of what defines it is vol volatile. Because to be a AAA game, you need to have a big budget. You need to have a brand attached to it. It's usually a big distributor and a medium to large studio or the, the main studio. In, like the main publisher and studio developing it. And it has to have a few features that are considered the important features of that time to be considered a AAA game. For instance, for a long time, you had a uh, multiplayer being implemented in every single AAA game, even games that did not benefit from multiplayer um, game Boot player functions, but you still have them because that was what it was expected of AAA games. And uh, that ends up creating a feedback loop with what the gamer culture is. The text on the right is a copy pasta. It became very famous on Reddit at some point, so much so that it was copied and pasted everywhere after that. Uh, legend has it, it's real. And I believe so, because I've seen a lot of texts like this all around. But the thing is, the idea is that the AAA marketing market and the gamer culture, they create a feedback loop in which one expects the other to to one influences what the other is going to do. The idea of gamer as an identity came upon around the same time as AAA came upon. So um, because gamers are people and values and ideas and perspectives change, that is going to influence what the AAA industry is going to do. And the AAA industry is going to try to indulge and to take risks based on that audience is going to consume. So there is a, a worry because, because it's a big budget game, you absolutely need to have a return. I'm sorry for my cat crying background, if you can hear it. 
And he is like that and they cannot control him. However, um, what I am proposing is that what if we can understand AAA games outside of that idea, that mainstream idea that is reinforced by what a game culture is and what games are supposed to be? What if we can produce, observe, and enjoy games in many other ways that are not that way? What I'm proposing is observing AAA games through the logic of queer temporality. So um, here we have a part of uh, J uh, Judith Jacks Halberstrom books in which it says, let me see because it's covering the, the, the bar is covering it. I have to cheat by looking here. Queer uses of space and time develop, at least in part, in opposition to your institutions of family, heterosexuality, and reproduction. They also develop according to other logics of location, movement, and identification. If we try to think about queerness as an outcome of strange temporalities, imaginative life schedules, and eccentric economic practice, we detach queerness from sexual identity. In this book, this group, we have in the queer space and time, which is from where I based my research, the queer way of life will encompass subcultural practices, alternative methods of alliance, forms of transgender embodiment, and those of forms of representation dedicated to capturing those these willfully eccentric modes of being. Further, queer subcultures produce alternative temporalities by allowing the participants to believe that the futures can be imagined according to, sorry, to logics that lie outside of those paradigmatic markers of life experience, namely birth, marriage, reproduction, and death. For the purpose of this book, we refer to non-normative logics and organizations of community, sexual identity, embodiment, and activity in time and space. So what do this mean? Well, it is important to point out that here in this definition, just like in most of queer studies, <clears throat> does not necessarily refer to sexuality and gender. A lot of aspects of one's life can affect their development and understanding of sexuality and gender, but there are other aspects that do not have to be connected to it that are also considered queer, and they are queered by queer st studies. We're talking about drug users, we're talking about sex workers, we're talking about people who do not, who decide to never have children. We're talking about uh, disabled people. We're talking about people who do not fit in a mainstream idea that that society where they belong have of a thing that happened, uh, that there's a time and place for things to happen. An example of that phenomenon, like to be more illustrative, could be a street downtown. During the day, you have businessmen, families, children, you have nannies going up and about, you have students walking around, and when, but after midnight, you will only find sex workers, drug users, drug traffickers, you'll find um, transgender people and other queer people walking around like going to parties. So you have the same space that changes completely depending on the time of the day. So you have by the term temporality, even though it has the name temporality, it refers to the time and space of those different bordering backdoor ideas. Uh, all work by JJ Halberstam is about being in the borders. It's very interesting. Uh, he talks about wild things, about uh, failure, and uh, but here we're going to focus on time and space and the experience of time and space. And uh, you have plenty of indie games that um, try to excite you, to, to, to nudge you to understand the world that way. Um, those games, they try to change, to direct the player to understand the world in a different time and place that a AAA idea, AAA logic does not fit. 
So uh, I, I'll bet some of those games are known, some of those games you do not know, and I, I urge you to look for them because they are great examples of how you can understand time and place in a different way. And I'm saying like indie games are like, they are, they more easily can create, can produce games that are outside this logic because it's usually, they are usually less constrained by big budgets and like high return. So they have a bit more freedom. However, what I am proposing is that you can do that with AAA games and you can even develop games with big budget games within that logic, given the right conditions. So let's go back and make a connection with um, Dragon Age. You have the idea that you have a lot of possibilities within the AAA logic and culture. I think it's extremely necessary. Many big companies are taking steps towards it with micro labels to allow for indie studios to be distributed by a major company. However, what I'm talking about is the analysis and understanding of games such as Dragon Age to start this. And why am I talking about Dragon Age in particular and not every or any other game? Because Dragon Age Origins is a game that was hugely successful. It is considered an example of this kind of game. It is considered a magnum opus and um, you have Dragon Age 2, which is considered technically a failure to be a AAA game, even though it's a sequel to the same, to the franchise and see, follows the same storyline, as to say. So it, it becomes a very easy, um, it becomes very easy to compare and contrast what their underlying logics are. Um, so let's start with Dragon Age Origins. In Dragon Age Origins, uh, you have the Dragon Age world is called Thedas and you have this um, nation called Ferelden. And in the world of Thedas, there's a big bad um, event that is comparable to Tolkien's orcs and to J.R.R. Martin's like cold people, snow people, I don't know how they're called, but they are like an unstoppable force of nature that corrupts the surface. They are underneath the so surface and they go to the surface to corrupt everything. It's called the blight. And uh, Ferelden is, there's a blight that's starting to happen in Ferelden. And there's an order of uh, special people that are able to defeat the blight by defeating the boss, the big boss of the blight, an archdemon. But to do that, that person has to drink what is effect, which is like the, the, those creatures, those orcs are called darkspawn. You have to drink darkspawn blood. So you become kind of part of the blight. And so you are able to defeat the big bad and you are not uh, infected anymore. So Dragon Age Origins has six possible origin stories here portrayed in this cute drawing. And, um, but all of them are going to take you, the player, to become a part of the Grey Wardens. Uh, also, when you drink the Dark Spall blood, you may die, and you probably will. <clears throat> you end up surviving, but right after that, the entire Grey Warden uh, order is destroyed through uh, a betrayal. And in the end, only you and another rookie warden are left. So you ended up getting finding a node which also magic is a forbidden thing in this world it's highly controlled because mages can lose control very easily so being a mage without the control of the central government is a crime and you find this old witch with a daughter they're both outside of control and this old witch says that you need to save the world and her daughter who's also a very mysterious witch follows you However, uh, throughout the story, you are the only one who can defeat everything. You, can, you need to go around making alliance. You need to follow that thing that fate says to you. 
the will of fate is right upon you. You are the only one who can do that. You are the only one who can work this out no matter what. And the warden is the tragic hero who <clears throat> in the end finds out that he has to die in order to destroy the archdemon. Everything led you to death. And even like the fact that you're a great warden will mean a, uh, a young death because you drank corruption. However, there's a way out. The witch Morrigan offers you a deal. If she manages to get pregnant from a Grey Warden, be it you or your friend, um, you will escape death because the essence of the Archdemon will enter the baby. But that's not the right thing. This is a mystery. This is something that she's not going to reveal what it is. If you do that, you're going to break what Grey Wardens do. You're going to follow a path that you're not supposed to fo follow. You're going to give power to a witch that you do not know who she is. You're going to give control to someone that is outside. Hey, Maria, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we have to have you leave some time for questions. So could you wrap oh, up in the next so, couple so, of minutes? Oh, I'm so, so, sorry. I'm going to rush okay. with this. So you have to trust her or not. Uh, in the case of DA2, you have the, the idea that you were a uh, war refugee running away from the events of, of Dragon Age Origins and you go to a city state in which you have no control. You really need to survive. You do not have an overarching team, team going around. So the big thing is that you start losing your family. You start losing your friends. All you need to do, you come from a very okay family that has a secret mage in there, so you are going to be persecuted no matter what. And if you are, you need to go to a place where it's um, very, they crack down on mages very hard. Crime is rife, there's a lot of death, and you can do anything but to try to survive in this place. Everything about Dragon Age 2 is about going outside of the norm and going outside through the lateral sides and living in the borders always. You take on responsibilities there because there's coin, there's rewards for you, not because you are destined to save the world. The world never has anything for you. You have a few mechanic and dynamic situations that probably were developed by intention and constraint. However, they end up becoming a uh, signifier, uh, end up signifying this um, leaning on the, the a more, um, how to say, wayward way to play the game. If you understand the game within the AAA logic, Dragon Age 2 is really, really bad because it doesn't feel like a AAA game. That's because it really breaks with the AAA logic by not making you the main character of your life. The main character is the city and you're trying to survive. In conclusion, um, I'm not trying to say that every game is supposed to be read through queer temporality, but what I say is that there's a strong, um, that I, I believe there should be a stronger movement to understand AAA games through ideas that are not controlled by the mainstream idea of the market and of main, the main opinion of gamers. And so by taking those games, that this franchise that is hugely popular and analyzing it through uh, temporality, I hope to have um, shown how that's possible. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking so long. Oh, don't, don't need to apologize. That's, that's why I'm here, uh, but thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, really appreciate that description. And I haven't played Dragon Age because it, it doesn't feel like my thing at the time, but I think I'm gonna try it now because it may, maybe it is. Um, I it's did like really Game of Thrones. Cool. It's really yeah. cool. I'm going to spandalize the, the slides later if you like. Awesome. Yes, please do that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we had some great stuff here today. This conference is the best. Um, some work that you'd never see elsewhere. Um, I'm really excited if all of you could join us. And um, to get into our questions, oh, I don't know why I'm looking for my phone. I wrote it on my computer. Um, but we have, for our first presenter, for Regina Mills, we have a question by Phil Phoenix Tadson. And Phil, would you like to ask it yourself? I have it written down. 
Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, I really appreciated all the talks on this panel. Thank you all very much. Um, for Regina, I just wanted to talk or ask about um, the production context and specifically the writers of this game, from what I can tell just by IMDBing, right? Benjamin Arfman and Mary Kenny are white and non-Latinx writers. And what impact do you think that has on the game's representation of culture? And in addition to what the developers did well, which I think you highlighted very well in your in your talk, what steps could they take to make improvements? Um, this is a great question because it's actually so like part of this project is towards this larger one that I'd like to do on like gaming Latinidad and thinking about narrative and representation and development. And one of the things that comes up when I'm thinking like, what is a Latino game or what is a Latinx game, right? Is some of the same things that also come up with like, what is Latino literature, right? Like, okay, is it just something by somebody of Latin American descent? Does it need to have particular themes? Does it need to have particular backgrounds? Like what, what's going on with this particular aesthetics, right? As Pablo pointed out too, sometimes people are like, oh, well, it needs to have this type of aesthetic to do this, right? Um, and of course, authorship is really hard to think about for games, right? Um, because you can think, okay, the writers are, are this, but like, okay, is that the only people who count towards this authorship? Um, or is, you know, what is, what is exactly happening there? So, you know, one thing is, I do think that it matters to think about, okay, obviously Evan Narcisse, who's Haitian American, is giving this narrative consultant, but like the official writers, right, as a consultant, you never know, like, okay, how much does that matter? How much do they take what you're doing? Um, and so I do think it would be, I think, important for us to think about, okay, um, what, you know, like how much does authorship matter to thinking about some of these themes? Is the is it a game that just talks about Latini that? Is it not? Um, I'm still kind of struggling, quite honestly, to think about what it would mean to talk about Latino games when it's so hard. Like, you're never going to have a developer team that's just basically all Latinos unless it's a couple people, right, in a certain sense. Um, and so I guess I'm still not exactly sure how to think about or kind of put that there. And I would love to see what other people think about that as well, um, because it's still something that I've kind of been struggling with, with like, what games am I going to pick? Um, what games um, count or don't? How do Latin American immigrants? Because also one thing is a lot of games often are made by Latin American immigrants or Latin American developers. And there's actually a lot fewer games that we know are, that are by like US Latinos, right, specifically. Um, so I think this actually just enters into a bigger question that I've just been thinking through and, you know, and I welcome other thoughts and stuff for that. So I know that's not necessarily the best answer, but maybe adds more questions that I think you're bringing up. Well, that's great. Thank you so much. And I hope that, that yeah, that all of us continue this dialogue. Thank you. Marta, good to see your cat there. <laughs> Yeah, don't worry about not controlling your cat. No one can. They are their own thing. Yeah, um, that's just my, my uncontrollable baby. <laughs> uh, I, I had a similar question for Regina, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on here because we had a question for our second presenter for Pablo. Uh, and it was also from Dr. Dr. Penix Tadson. So um, again, I, I I'll open the mic to you, but I can also post it in the chat if you'd like. Sure, sure. That would be great because uh, I think it's it's buried pretty deeply there somewhere. But uh, Pablo, I really appreciated your talk and all of your the ways that you tied in philosophy and cultural studies and things. Um, I just wanted to ask about, you know, you're kind of pushing for greater authenticity and cultural representation. And I completely understand that. But I wonder if you think there's a danger of pigeonholing developers into the expectation of, you know, if you're Mexican, you have to make a Mexican themed game, for example. And what about those who might want to make Kerbal Space Program? Yeah. OK. Um, <clears throat> the problem, I think, with uh, non-mainstream uh, creators, that is from ethnic backgrounds, national backgrounds, um, social cultural backgrounds, is the expectation that they talk about what they are supposed to know. And in that regard, uh, especially for Latin Americans, I refer to the works of Roberto Bolaño, because he was a completely different author. And I reclaim him, what, right, because Kerbal Space Program is the perfect example that uh, Mexicans are part of the modern world like everyone else. Uh, my call is not just for more cultural authenticity, it's just for making serious cultural authenticity. Let's say that you're taking games such as uh, Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice, which is beautifully crafted, beautifully constructed, and beautifully researched. And it happens to deal with uh, Albanaich and Viking mythology, and it's well made. Well, if you take themes from Latin American culture, have the same respect for the source material. 
And that doesn't detract from the fact that, okay, you're Mexican and you want to write science fiction about ancient China. Great, of course, absolutely do it. But if you are going to do cultural representation of any kind, at least play the same respects you would for Romans, Greeks, Vikings, uh, Middle Ages, uh, Muslims. And that's especially true even for, for the case of Haiti because voodoo has been represented time and time again in the most non-flattering way possible. And my guess is, okay, if you represent Christianity in all its forms, Protestant, Catholic, Calvinistic, whatever, Islam in a really uh, respectful and informed way, play the same respect for voodoo or for any indigenous religion. So my call is, if you are going to represent a culture, put resources to really uh, research and represent the culture. But that doesn't detract from the fact that if you want to do something else entirely like, like Rock of Ages, which is a Chilean game, by all means, go ahead. But the tone is completely different. It's basically a big, massive joke. And for big, big massive jokes in, in, the, in, the, in the venue of the, um, Dussel's transmodernity, I think it's not just good, but desirable that Latin Americans give a glimpse uh, and sometimes a joyful glimpse of European Middle Ages. And honestly, it's refreshing. It needs to happen more often. Thank you so much. Fantastic answer. And I love Rock of Ages too. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, to go along with that, I posted a link in the chat for um, Dr. Christopher Bell's research. He is a um, scholar at Colorado Springs of, of cultural representation. Um, but he actually had a TED talk that got picked up by the actual TED website. Um, and he is now one of the heads of diversity at, at Pixar. Um, so he talks a lot about how we do these cultural representations and he worked a lot on soul. Um, so he has some good resources there for us to look at that kind of stuff. Like what Pablo was saying, if you're gonna do any sort of representation, put the resources into it. And that's kind of what he advocates as well. Um, we had a question from Jack and he's no longer with us. And I mean, in the chat, not in, not in life. Um, but his question was also for Regina Mills, and he, he said, and it's similar to Dr. Uh, to Phil's question and to mine as well. So, what is the line we're playing as a black as a black video game protagonist becomes a form of cultural appropriation? Yeah, so like some people talk about like the term like digital blackface, which is one of those things that I'm I'm you know still reading about and learning about because one of the things that I often see that be used in two contexts. One thinking about people using like emojis and gifs that right are black um, performers like you know and and basically trying to kind of embody or use often very exaggerated or stereotypical ways of thinking about black culture right um, or when people can create their own avatars and they create them as a racial identity they don't identify with right that way they can either act out certain ways of being um, this doesn't really fit that same way because there's no actual choice you have right to be this character in the same way that most video games right like don't like if you're playing Peter Parker and Spider-Man you're just Peter Parker you can't be Peter Parker like darker skinned or lighter skinned right um and so it, it's one of those things where you're just like okay well like if that was the case we'd have to think about I think we need to think more about, okay, so how are they trying to represent Miles Morales? Is it to let us play super stereotypical, harmful ideas about Black Latinidad? Or is it to have us play, right, as a character who's kind of fully human and interesting and the same way that when we read a book that has a protagonist that isn't us, right, we have, we're, we're, we're allowed to kind of relate in how we relate or not relate in the way that we don't relate. So I don't know that I'm super worried that it's like a form of digital blackface just because I don't think it fits in those other ways that I've read about it. However, I'd be definitely welcome to see what other people have written about it. Um, or thinking of, you know, thinking about if there has been some people who have considered, okay, what does it mean when you don't have a choice about the racial identity that you're embodying in a game? Um, and if anybody else has something what they want to add to that, please do, you know. Yeah, no, thank you. That could be really interesting. I didn't think about the fact that you don't have a choice um, and how that could play a role. Like looking at, because I've most of the stuff I've seen also is like when you have a choice, why are you enacting different sorts of um, behaviors? But when you don't have a choice, what what happens then? Is that is it okay to do certain behaviors or not? Um, how does that how does that um, go in there? Um, yeah, so I put something in the chat. I noticed your your Triforce earrings here, Regina. When I was when you were talking, I was also paying attention, but I noticed them, and I'm a huge Zelda fan, so I was very happy to see that. 
Um, but they're we, awesome. My dad gave them to me for Christmas. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Love that. I wish my parents knew how much I love Zelda. So they get me stuff. Um, but so we're now officially in our break time. The next session is going to start here in a few minutes. But of course, the conversation should and we'll keep going. We'll keep the chat open. We'll keep the video open. So if you still have questions for our presenters or you have other questions for other people, um, I think Mariana has something she wants to ask. So go ahead. Uh, so I was thinking when I uh, just see your amazing uh, work today, and I was thinking about the cannibalism and all the stuff about appropriation. And I think that you also can put this in your work because to be a cannibalist is also to respect, to get to have a lot of respect for what you are eating because you want to impersonate this. So maybe don't be, but remember I'm talking like a Brazilian. And you know what that means. <laughs> so sometimes we did we do a lot of humor with things, but with respect. Uh, what I can say about that? Respect about the things uh, is how I can say that without being misunderstood. Uh, you can pick something that is not yours and pay all the the respects and really see what this has to offer your kind of vision of road and fantastic, but also you can imagine and you can get out of your own bubble. What I have been seeing in this uh, last uh, five years is that uh, maybe we are so stuck to our world, to our reality, that we cannot really enjoy a fantastic world that doesn't is so cool, cool, uh, so like rule bending, like token, also like so perfect and so well rounded because we are we want everything to have a background. Oh, what is the background? What is it? Sometimes you don't need a background because it's fantasy, and sometimes fantasy can be only fantasy. And I'm just saying that because uh, realismo fantastic is like a big kind of genre in literature, and maybe. We should extend this to games too. Why Gabriel Garcia Marquez? They they can lead the twins can be changed or the 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 spirits can come and nobody question anything because we don't need to question sometimes it's, it's fiction. It's not real world. Okay, uh, so maybe I think that Regina, uh, maybe this can be a trace of Latin <laughs> for you. Uh, this kind of voice this feeling that we have that always mix up. Uh, we laugh a lot uh, because we, we say that we laugh because we don't want to cry. So we laugh because it's, it's easier to uh, take life like that. And maybe it's like this feeling, this, this kind of, it's not that we are from uh, South America, Central America. It's not uh, who our parents are, but the feeling that we have, this, this cultural bond, this, this kind of uh, way of seeing life and putting all together and we are everything and we are nothing. I, I, I don't know who is my ancestors. I have a lot of ancestors. <laughs> so uh, from different places of the world. So I have a lot of different things going on and I'm nothing, you know? Uh, I'm everything and nothing at some time. It's okay. And maybe, and I don't question my, the fiction. I think I don't say I'm not. I'm not saying that this is the Latin American stuff and all. But I say that maybe from like South Brasilia that I am, and near Argentina, Uruguay, and things like that. And from Brazil, maybe that's something that you can look at it. Our literature, literature, literature. Ah, I, I cannot say this word. This book genre <laughs> of realism, fantastic. Maybe it can help you something yes that's all no i totally think you're right and i was just putting i think that like sometimes it doesn't have to be and in fact that's the thing too is that like there's a lot of latino game developers that are making games that aren't like latino theme right because one thing is we think these are the, the only things that latinos write about or think about and you know one thing is that it just could be them creating a world and that's just them creating a world right it doesn't have to be based in our ideas about race and ethnicity it can be based in other ones it can be based it can try to break free of those entirely so it's definitely not something that has to be 
like, are you authentic to this, right? Because, you know, literature isn't about being only so limited, right? It's about imagining other worlds and things too. So yeah. I think you're totally right. Maybe uh, how, how they do it. Maybe uh, there's a phenomenon. It's not who, it's not where, but how. Maybe you can find the Latino in how we do it and the phenomenon. The problem I see is basically a power imbalance. And this is something that uh, Deepresh Chakravarti uh, presented perfectly in provincializing Europe. I, as a European man, have the capacity to imagine anywhere in the world. But many people anywhere in the world do not have the right or the capacity or the, the place to imagine a completely different Southern Europe, Why? which is where they're from. But Why? Why? Effectively, the industry will not publish them. But, but, but that I is think not only the industry. Well, the, the problem is how many Tolkien's have you seen in South America? How many Tolkien's? But you don't have to have a Tolkien. We yeah, have the like ideas to write our fantasy. Like I was saying in the chat, Maya and the Three, it's a fantastic example of a Mexican um, story told in a fantasy uh, setting based on Aztec uh, and Nahua uh, mythology and reality, and is a Mexican point of view. It's a Mexican lens. Like the entire, this is not like, like Disney, it's my cat. Like Disney is doing a Mexican story. It's a Mexican person writing a Mexican story from a Mexican perspective. It's not about saying, oh, how many tokens there are in Latin America? We don't need a token. We have Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and that's fine. You know, we do not have need justice. to adapt to an European or North American reality. It's I don't think, I, I lived in Spain for like a year. And from my experience, it's easier for us to understand Spain than it is for Spain to understand us. Because we know, we see Don Quixote everywhere, but you don't see what we do. <laughs> exactly, and that's my point. The problem is a matter of reaching. It's not a matter of creating. It's, uh, and that's the issue is, Tolkien is a worldwide thing. However, there are people who are making, and, and I'm thinking someone like uh, Timamanda Adichie. You really, really, really have to work to get their, their work, in particularly in Spain which is such a shame because she's a fantastic writer. And yeah. well, one I mean, of the in best- Spain, the editorial do. world in Spain, one of my best friends works in the, in the editorial world in Spain. She says it's really hard to bring people from Latin America and other places uh, to the Spanish editorial world, but so is to bring Latin American people to the United States, for instance. You see a lot, but recently there has been an anthology kickstarted that was about latin american uh, celebration but they only chose a latin like u.s latina people no one from latin america proper which is fine but then you cannot call it a latin american celebration it's a diaspora celebration which is good and fine and we can communicate with it a lot i am diaspora right now by have my like being like studying in the united states However, my, I grew up in Latin America. People who were born in the United States, even with the heritage, have a different identity, a different Latin identity than I do. What we need to find is the points in common and the differences to make everything work like weave together and not think like we are each in one space or that we are all the same. You know, it's about carving spaces. I really like this conference because it's a, a conference that where we can see the space being being carved by people from very different um, perspectives, like, which is really interesting. But the thing is, we don't need Tolkien. We don't need to be like the editorial um, market in Spain and Europe and like the United States need to be more open. Yes, of course it must, but the reason for this is completely imperial. Hey, Mar, 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 <laughs> when, when the education is not from freedom, uh, the, the oppressed became the oppressors, right? Yeah, yeah Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire, yes, the dream of the oppressors to become the oppressor. 
Yeah, so, but we don't want to be like this. Exactly. So but even in Brazil, we have of education. Yeah, we are the imperial like fight against, right? The Brazil but, is the imperial power of South America. We yeah, do not then, have a lot of Latin American authors published there. Yes, we all okay. deal with imperialism in different parts. So we need to know how to know who we are without being yeah. one person. <laughs> and we have to broke broke the cycle, right? Yeah, to we have to be the, the, the imperial and not be the imperial, and everyone has to has their voice and place. Yes, I think that was a great, great. Thing. Yeah, so it's not just like yes, the imperial. If you have like the editorial uh, market in those places, need to be broken, of course. But that's a work that sh you gotta do. We in Brazil need to work this out. United States had to work this out. Europe has to work this out. Like people in there have to do the job, not us. <laughs> We're not the target audience. We already want to, to read and listen to your stories. The problem like we're doing, is we're trying, it, like we end up others. becoming, we have, we are forced to become the, like the voices of our origins, even if we don't want to we end up having to stand for our culture and country of origin because if we want to be heard, we need to write, if we want our perspectives to be heard, we need to point out that we are different. <laughs> and that's not a comfortable place to be. <laughs> yes, never is, never is. I was sliding back into the conversation as I get ready for the next panel. And uh, 